That was the idea. Well, you think David wanted to build the house for God uh, so as he could take his family by there and say, looky what I did? You think David wanted to build the temple uh, for God because he wanted to have his name recorded in history? Why did David want to do that for God? For God's sake, what I can do for God. God's done a lot for us, has He not? You know, folks, it's time we ask, what can I do for God? And uh, that leads me then to our faith promise sheet. If we might take just a moment or two uh, to look at it uh, carefully. Uh, whenever I think of a place for God and the work of God and preaching the gospel to every creature and trying to get the word of Jesus Christ out around the world, I, I think to myself, how can I do that? And I would like to say that to me, the very top place on the list is the local church. Now, I say that because that's God's way. I mean, hey, folks, in the, it's in the Bible. Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. And I know you can use that generically if you so desire. Uh, but I'll tell you, it's got to be ultimately translated into the visible local church. No other way around it. And I believe that that's God's way, and consequently, I believe that's the best way, right? Makes sense to me anyway. If God organizes, if God puts an organization into business, if God's in it, then I think, I believe that has got to be the very best way possible. And so I think of our local church here, and the top thing on the faith promise sheet that I pass out is about tithes. Now you guys all know Malachi 3.10 by heart, probably. Uh, by this time most churches use this so much. And uh, I, I love the verse. Uh, after God talking to him about their robbing him, he says in tithes and in offerings, not just tithes, but in offerings, remember, that was brought out this week already. But here in Malachi 3.10, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, saith the Lord. Now, God's got plenty of, of money. He doesn't need our money. He must be wanting it done this way to give us a blessing. You say, boy, what a roundabout way of thinking. The preacher's nigh on to crazy. There have been a lot of people saying to me, that I'm crazy for a long time, so it doesn't bother me anymore. I want to say this, though, that, that giving good stewardship is not only a way of financing God's program, it's a way of raising Christians to maturity in Jesus Christ our Lord. You'd be surprised of what God can demonstrate to you as far as His power goes by giving to the Lord. And uh, so, yes, I'm one of those who believes in tithing. And on our sheet, all you do is have a place to make an X or a check or your mark if you're from the Old West and I don't know how to write yet. You'll find on the sheet there is no place for your name because this is between you and God, not between you and me or you and the Trinity Church or whatever. It's between you and God. But it helps us to reference things and get budgets prepared and get going to see what we can do and what we can't do. And so I believe very first there is the tithe. And I think that when it comes to the church and my statement about the church being very important, I think I, I would uh, say that i got to tell you, there's more than tithing. Uh, folks, to me, tithing is about the bottom rung of the ladder. Because there are a lot of things that go into making a church go. One of them is your attendance. And you may say, well, all I do is just come and warm a pew. That's a blessing to the preacher's heart, in case you're interested. That's very much a blessing to the preacher's heart. I would a whole lot rather have people in the pews than empty pews out there. It's a blessing to my heart. Attendance is important. Praying for your church is important. Praying for the pastor is important. Here's one for you. Loyalty to your local church is important, I think. Man, I've known people who had a sense of loyalty to their church and uh, even such a sense of loyalty that they would come home early on vacation so they could be at their church for Sunday services and so on. I 
you know, one of the biggest churches in the world at the time was Temple Baptist Church up in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, G.B. Vick was the pastor of the church. And uh, they, they had thousands. They, they, uh, most of their church members, 17,000 church members, most of them were uh, shift workers at the big three, Chrysler and GM and uh, Ford. I don't want to leave Ford out. Uh, the, um, the church would run 46,000 on Sunday morning and 46,000 on Sunday night, but it'd be generally two different crowds of people. As many could come to every service, came to every service. But a lot of times, people would be working shift week. Back in those days, in the 60s, of course, the factories up there in Detroit were humming, making cars. The seeds were being sown, of course, to undermine the American manufacturing process, I think, but be that as it may, way back then they were really humming and going, and consequently uh, Beach and Vic had a tremendously large Sunday school uh, structured basically just like our churches. I mean, they had Sunday school, then they had the morning church service, they didn't have the junior churches or the teenage churches, or the other. everybody had class graded Sunday school lessons in Sunday school and they all met in their sanctuary that was, would seat close to 6,000 people I guess uh, for the morning church service. And then, <clears throat> uh, same Sunday night, same Wednesday night. The church was structured basically just like our church. Uh, I hadn't quite gotten this brave yet, but Beecham Vick, a real diplomat, knew how to work with people. He was good at it. Some are good at it, some are not. Uh, he um, had a requirement for all of his Sunday school teachers that they could only be gone one Sunday a year from their Sunday school class. He said, you need to show your kids in your Sunday school classes or whatever that you're serious about being in Sunday school and church and that you're loyal to your church. And he said, most of them get two weeks vacation uh, from the big three and so on. Uh, that was back in those days. I know people are getting three and four weeks vacation now, but two weeks was good stuff back in the 60s, uh, if any of you guys remember. And he said, uh, I'd tell them to leave Sunday night after church, be gone that next Sunday, and be back by the next Sunday morning before Sunday school. And you say, well, boy, I bet he didn't have very many Sunday school teachers. Well, I don't know. Their Sunday school ran in the vicinity of four to 6,000 every Sunday. And uh, that was one of the requirements for being a Sunday school teacher. I tell you, folks, loyalty to one's local church makes a difference. You want to know what helps a local church go? It's people's loyalty. Uh, somebody said, and I, I think it was that coach, I, I've forgotten the guy's name now, maybe Vince Lombardi, he was a coach. Maybe he's the one that said, the best stability is dependability. And I think that it's important to consider that helping the church go, loyalty is right in there. Hey, the music program, uh, cleaning the building, yeah, even the bathrooms and so on. You say, well, uh, I, God hasn't called me to do that. Uh, it's all right to get in on some stuff God hadn't called you to. Especially when so many people have been called to that kind of stuff don't want to hear the call. And, and cleaning. Hey, listen, you guys would be surprised about the mechanics that go on around here during the week just to have services on Sunday. Brother Gary knows exactly what I'm talking about because he was here uh, for all that time. I tell you, just the cleaning of the building, the yard work, visitation, van ministry, all of those kind of things, and yes, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. And you say, well, it sounds to me like you guys are money hungry. Hey, listen, take it up with the Lord. He's the one that printed it in his Bible. Of course, you want to be careful when you approach the throne of grace. Or something like that. When it comes to that, then I'm going to skip over the missions part of this sheet just a moment and go on down to the building program part of the sheet. Uh, you may pray, uh, Lord, uh, would you like me to kick into the building fund? Now, God has blessed our church tremendously in this area. As you guys know, our buildings are all paid for. Properties are all paid for and so on. But as a minister in my, my business thought process and so on, it's good for a church to keep a good amount of money in their building fund for major repairs that may come along. 
or whatever may come along. As I mentioned one night during our conference this week, one roof repair on our building, or not repair, but one exchange of roofs would be in the vicinity of $100,000. And of course, I also, folks, am trying to keep in mind that business of a church parsonage because I think that is something that is important for us to keep in mind. Remember, before the fire in 2007, we had the church parsonage. We don't have the church parsonage anymore. Now, by the way, I didn't live in it. The church gave me a housing allowance three years after I came here, and all the debts were paid and everything uh, came out of the basement into the... Uh, uh, a penthouse, so to speak, financially in the church. They gave me a housing allowance, and as you guys know, Marsha and I have our own house out in Pflugerville right now. But uh, you remember when Roger was with me, he lived in the parsonage, and then when Roger left, we used the parsonage for a kind of hotel for our guests and people that would come in and for other things. Uh, I think that's something that we ought to keep our minds on, uh, by the way. So you might want to say, well, hey, I can kick in so much to the building fund. And then down here, advertising and youth camp. Uh, while you're at it, you know how preachers are. You give them an inch, they take a mile. But... Um, Advertising is important. Uh, it's kind of uh, expensive, too. Um, you take, uh, for instance, do you guys remember before the fire we did that TV ad campaign? That cost us over $30,000. But we probably generated more talk about the church and interest in the church through that advertising campaign on uh, the uh, most watched television station in Austin at that time. You guys may remember the door-to-door -door mail out we made one time. Do you guys realize that we spent nearly $60,000 on that door-to-door -door mail out? It takes a lot of money. Well, I'm not sure exactly which way to go now. KHOU just called me the other day and wanted me to consider advertising on their website. And they were talking about 100 to 200,000 hits. You see, you don't get the same ad on a website every time you hit that website. I don't know whether I want to do that or not. It's something I have to think about and pray about and then talk to the men about and so on and so forth. But it, it's, it is something that is to consider. Here's another thing, another TV ad or, or billboards. You know these billboards out here? Uh, what did we find out when we were doing the TV advertising? Those billboards back at that time were about $5,000 a month. This thing. Were they, Brother Brantley, close in that anyway? And I think it is wise to advertise. Besides that, uh, I'm wanting to start up some other things to try to get word out door to door about the church and get people in church. Ultimately speaking, the local church needs to be just that. The local church trying to reach people, men and women and boys and girls for Jesus Christ in their local area. There's the van ministry and all that kind of stuff. And so I think it's good to kick in a couple bucks if you can uh, for advertising. And then uh, camp, if you'd care to have a part in that. Uh, if we have 20 or more going to youth camp, uh, I'd like to charter a bus to go and they don't give those charters away anymore. You say, well, why do you charter a uh, bus, Brother Burkholder? Why don't you just uh, use our vans and so on? Well, we have for the last several years, and I'm glad of it. As you guys know, we bought two brand, nearly brand new vans at one time, so we didn't have mechanical problems, no tire problems, nothing like that. But you've got to realize also that if you charter from a reputable company, like uh, Kerrville Bus Company, that's the one I generally charter from. Uh, you've got the insurance all covered, you've got the professional driver all covered, uh, you've got everything by way of liability all covered, and you've got a restroom on board. I knew that would get the attention of some. Now with that I want to go back to the missions part of this. Mainly now, you know, we used to emphasize building more than we do now, uh, but boy, God's provided there and we're taken care of now. Again, I'm still trying to build up the building fund after our building, but still, God's been with us. So just pray about it. Ask the Lord. He'll lay on your heart what He wants you to do for that. These areas down here. I want to go up here to missions just a moment or two. Not only uh, can we have a part in getting the gospel out here locally, but also around the world. And one man put it this way, which I think is a good way of putting it, either go or help somebody go. 
that kind of the program there. Do you realize that with a missionary offering, well, uh, another man put it like this way, uh, one of my old professors said, go ye into all the world with a missionary offering. Do you realize that you can be an integral part to worldwide missions? through the missionary program of Trinity. I mean, if you look at the back of our bulletin, and not all the missionaries are listed on there. I was looking at it this morning. I'm sorry I don't keep up with it very good. I need to keep up with it better. But all the way from Hong Kong to Australia to Israel, do you realize that we have a missionary in Bethlehem? And, of course, Bethlehem is walking distance of Jerusalem. That's how that works over there. Uh, Nam Khoury is his name. Uh, Marcia has down here Lebanon, uh, Edgar Figali, but Edgar goes all through the Middle East now. You know, Edgar was born in Beirut and got saved in Beirut uh, under uh, a missionary that one of my churches I pastored supported, a guy named Clyde Ains, and uh, then another guy named Pepper Garrett uh, took over that church after Clyde Ains went on and uh, uh, started uh, another mission in some other part of Lebanon. We uh, have Edgar Figali over there. He's a, uh, I think it's okay to say Edgar is an Arab. Wouldn't that be the way to put it? Uh, he looks like we do, but uh, he's got that Arab citizenship. He can travel freely all over through those companies, uh, countries over there. And Arab has works, uh, pardon me, Edgar has works going in Iraq, He's got works going in Iran. He's got works going in the stands. Afghanistan, Pakistan. He's got works going in, in northern uh, Africa over there. He's got works going all over that place. Uh, I really think uh, he's doing a great work. He's, he's got uh, ministers who are local citizens uh, with local churches doing basically about what we're doing here. Boy, I praise God for it. And then, uh, of course, you've heard me speak about Sam Slobodian before also, have you not? Uh, Sam, um, man, I, I tell you, if you didn't get his book uh, about his dad, Peter Slobodian, To God Be the Glory, I think was the name of it. Uh, I've got some of the books I'll... Uh, I, I try to give away some for gifts. If you didn't get one, I'll sell you one. But I, I buy and buy the case, so I get them a little cheaper. Um, uh, if you look real sorry and, uh, and real poor, I might sell you one a little less. <laughs> but uh, it's a great book. Sam Slobodian. I remember that shortwave radio business while the Soviet Union was still going on? And they had Christians. Sam would go over there with Bibles and so on uh, in the former Soviet Union. And his dad would go over there. And uh, of course his, his uh, uh, ancestry is from the Ukraine. Consequently, they have works going through that whole area of the former Soviet Union which, by the way, includes many of the Middle Eastern stand countries, Islamic countries, where they've got churches going, pre uh, preaching the gospel, and guys going out basically like we're doing here. What I'm trying to say is, is you can be an integral part in world missions because we have missionaries. You can look at it back there all over the place. I mean, Scotland, Rick Moeller, Romania, Gary Matheny, uh, your friend there, in the Philippines, Nicaragua, Nepal. I read you a letter from David Freeman the other night uh, about his work in Kathmandu and what's going on over there. Uh, of course, we have several missionaries down in Mexico. We've got a missionary down in Brazil. I'm glad to have our missionary from uh, Brazil here, uh, Brother Don Leaf. We do not support him on a monthly basis, but we do support Steve Campbell down there. You guys remember Steve Campbell? He's, he's just kind of an old farm boy type guy. But boy, he's getting a job done up and down all those Amazon jungles and uh, so on in there. And I praise the Lord for him. Well, I could go on and on, uh, but uh, I do wish to impress upon you, you can be a part in it. And I'm not stretching the truth one bit when I say this. If you help get the gospel out in a foreign country through a missionary offering, 
Now I want to be careful because this shouldn't be our motive. Um, what I started to say was if you help get the gospel out in a foreign country, you've got a part in everybody that comes to Christ through that missionary's effort. Everybody that grows in the Lord, you've got a part in it. And boy, when you get to heaven, you've got a better chance of hearing a well done, thou good and faithful servant. Even though it may have been your part. Now, that's the part that I, I halted on all of a sudden. Because our motive should not be for any glory for self whatsoever. Our motive ought to be trying to get the gospel of Jesus Christ out. Listen, folks, our world is in a mess, if you want my opinion. I mean, from our country to the entire world, it's in a mess. We're, we're on the, the cliff's edge, as it were. A lot of talk out of D.C. about that. We're on the cliff's edge. i got to tell you, Jesus is the answer. Amen. Not only to the, the world's problems, but uh, to our own local problems right here. To the, to the problem of the home. What is the answer? I, I tell you, if a husband gets right with Jesus Christ as Savior, if a wife gets right with Jesus Christ, if the individual gets to the point where they want to put the Lord first, that's the answer. What's the answer to the teenager's problem? What's the answer to the kid's problem? What's the answer to lots of church problems today? Putting the Lord first. Jesus is the answer. Do you remember when John stood the next day and they followed Jesus? Two of the disciples were with him and John said, Behold the Lamb of God. And they followed Jesus. They followed Jesus. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and brought him to Jesus. He brought him to Jesus. I tell you folks, it's not empty terminology nor rhetoric when you say Jesus is the answer. He is the answer. Amen. Died on the cross for our sin that we might have eternal life in heaven. And then uh, I believe he says, Now as long as I leave you here on the earth, I want you to let your light so shine that men may see your good works and uh, thereby you glorify your Father which is in heaven. I want to give you a couple of keys to this and then I'm going to be asking you to mark your sheets and pass them to the aisle, those of you who are ready. Uh, some keys to successful faith promise. One is commitment. And you say, well, Brother Burkholder, I don't want to commit to anything because I may not be able to do it. Well, now, that's just one of the problems in our country today. It used to be that when people got married, they committed themselves one to each other. It used to be when, when people committed themselves to a loan, they would see to it that loan was paid for. I remember days when men had the integrity. If they couldn't make loan payments, they'd go to the banker and tell him, I'm sorry. Uh, please, can you give me an extension? I will make it up one way or another. Now we're in a mentality of walking away and leaving it. I don't believe that's pleasing under the Lord. We need commitment. Well, we need commitment in faith promise also. Another thing we need is a burden. I don't believe any church is going to have a successful missions program or local program without its people having a burden for the lost and a burden that the saved grow in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Psalm 126, 5 and 6 speaks about they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. I believe another key to successful uh, work in the local church as well as around the world is the business of... Uh, uh, love for God. And I get that from Mark chapter number 12 verse 33. Oh, to love God in that way, said the scribe, is more than all whole burnt offerings. And sacrifice. You know, this is probably going to sound salty, but the real problem in most of our lives is we really don't love the Lord like we should. If you really love somebody, hey, nothing's too good for them. I remember when uh, Marsha and I were getting engaged, I wanted to get her to the nicest diamond ring I could. As I've told you before, it was lost. Somewhere down there where the old church was. 
It was a marquee diamond, a small one, but it was a it was a lot of money to me back then when I was still in college. I guarantee you. And um, that diamond was lost. Well, she managed to get a bigger marquee diamond out of the <laughs> thing. You see, when you love somebody, you enjoy lavishing gifts upon them. And I got to tell you, folks, our God loves us and delighteth in giving us good things. Likewise, we should for Him. I think love is important. I think participation is important. If I could get the whole church to participate, wouldn't that be great? They say, statistically, I don't know where they got this statistic, you know how statistics are, but they say that in most churches, 10% of the people do 90% of the work and giving. I don't think it's that way at Trinity at all. I think we have a, a high percentage of people who give and, and are liberal givers uh, to the work of the Lord. But I will go ahead and say that participation is very, very important. One more thing is faithfulness. You know, if you put down, I'm going to give a uh, million dollars a week to Faith Promise million, uh, Missions, uh, then give your million dollars a week. I don't see many of you looking too seriously about giving a million dollars a week. That's all right. Uh, you don't ask me what to give. Another key to Faith Promise Missions is praying and asking the Lord. And He'll lay something on your heart. And with that, I would like to say that we have the local work and we have the work around the world. And by the way, as I think about the work around the world, I think about our nation. I think God has been good to America in part because America is still the leading missionary country of the world. Do I not speak the truth? I mean, basically, where is the gospel coming from? That being the case, we need to keep up our own country as much as possible. And of course we have Brother Sommerdorf over here, goes up and down the land all around the states preaching. I think he's got one week open next year, or maybe he doesn't have it open anymore, I don't know. But he's constantly preaching everywhere around the world. And uh, you know, certainly I believe folks that it's wise for us to consider our own local church our United States of America, and the entire world. With that, I'm going to ask you to take your sheet in hand. I'm going to ask us to bow and pray. Even as I pray out loud, I hope that you'll pray silently. And then we're going to be marking our sheets, and then we'll have you pass them to the aisle. Our Father in heaven, I thank you for thy love and goodness. I thank you that thou hast loved us and bought us off of the slave market of sin with thine own blood. Thou hast redeemed us to thyself. And I pray, God, that now you'll help us to have that joyful heart of cheerful giving unto thee. I pray thee to lead the folks in uh, what they do. I pray thee, O oh God, to have thy will and way in each individual's life, even as I trust their praying unto thee at this very moment for that guidance from thy Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, now then, if you're going to tithe, mark an X in the tithe box.